Thank you uh, to you for coming, to BIC for, uh, for hosting this, uh, and to all of you. I'll begin by asking uh, Mr. Dullat uh, to tell us something about his background and the etymology of his name and what it means. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks to the BIC. Um, you know, Akar Sahib, uh, I'm glad you're on my right side tonight. <laughs> he reminds me of my favorite uh, cabinet minister in the Vajpayee government, who was also Atulji's Man Friday. I don't have to name names because it's quite obvious. But uh, having heard him a few days ago at the Matra Bhumi festival, I'm a bit scared because the, that day he was uh, talking about the price of the Modi years and he had uh, all the data on his fingertips. So I don't know what kind of price I'm going to have to pay today. But uh, shoot, sir, whatever you say and so, whatever you uh, want. Something about your background, where you came from, where you grew up, and what the, what the meaning of your name is. What does Dullat mean? Yeah, this is, uh, you know, where I came from, where I grew up, and where I belong. As, uh, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, I'm a thoroughbred uh, Punjabi. And we are Jat Sikhs, although my mother was Hindu. And in those days, uh, these uh, intercaste marriages were quite frequent. So, But uh, the gay name came from, uh, in those days, uh, uh, alphabet was picked out of the Granth Sahib. And since uh, it was Ara, which is A, so I got the name Amarjeet Singh. Now, Dulat is, um, is a confusing thing. The nearest I've come to searching it is that uh, uh, Sir Lepel Griffin, in, in one of his books on the Rajas of the Punjab, says that uh, these guys originally belonged to, um, they were Rajputs who belonged to Bikaner. And uh, they used to wear their hair long, two plaits. And two plaits in the vernacular meant uh, Dolat. And that's how the name uh, Dolat came about. However, wherever it came from, at some stage we seem to have uh, shifted from Bikaner to Longowal, and finally to Naba. So when anybody asks us, where do you belong, we say Naba, although I've spent very little time in Naba, really. Did the family retain any memory of Rajput ancestry, um, or was it always Punjabi through and through? Never heard of the Ra Rajput ancestry, no. No, it's only written in history books, that's So all. it's the uh, curiosity that you had to look at the name and try and find... But quite possibly it's true, because, you know, the Patiala family uh, claims that it came from Jaisalmer. So if they came from Jaisalmer and we are closely connected to the Patiala family, then uh, we may have come from Bikaner. I think the story is possibly true. Uh, and do you know of any other families that have migrated uh, from the Rajasthani Rajput uh, tradition to uh, Sikhism? Yeah, a lot of Jat families came actually from, from Rajasthan. Interesting, I didn't know that. Uh, what drew you to becoming a, a policeman and separately, uh, why did you choose the uh, Intelligence Bureau? Neither of those were by choice, you know. I just... Uh, appeared for the civil services uh, exam. And uh, frankly, I was aiming for the foreign service or second best to the IAS. I didn't make either of those. And uh, what was on offer was either the central services or the police service. And uh, my father said, uh, the police service is an all India service, so don't think twice. Join the police service. And I joined the police service. And I was allotted uh, Rajasthan, and I spent uh, two and a half, or close to three years in Rajasthan. And I was not very happy being sent to Rajasthan, because again, I wanted to go to the Punjab. But when I 
actually went to Rajasthan. I found that uh, I was quite lucky because people there exceptionally good. It was a good cadre, wonderful officers, a good place to work, but I didn't last very long. Because in those days, there was a scheme in the Intelligence Bureau, which uh, the great B.N. Malik had started, uh, called the earmarking scheme, under which uh, from each IPS batch, three or four officers were picked and brought to the IB. And uh, his scheme, of course, was that you come, spend four years in the IB, go back to the state, do a district, because we came as ass assistant superintendents of police, very young. I was 25 uh, or 26 when I came to the, the bureau. And, uh, but in most cases like, like mine, we never went back to the state. We just stayed on, it became a career. Before I ask you the next question, did you say that the IAS was the second most preferred service at that time? And the IFS was the most? Oh yeah, it was. In does I it still I remain the case? No, it doesn't, it doesn't. Why? Now, now very few people uh, want to go the, to join the foreign service. Just, it's just a, as an aside before we move on, why is that the case? You see, in our days, there was a great uh, allure of uh, going abroad and, and seeing the world and, and whatever it was. Uh, today, I, I don't think, uh, I, I think kids have, um, their priorities are very clearly worked out, you know. So, they prefer the customs and the income tax to... <laughs> I think we know why that is. Can you tell us a little bit about what the mandate of the Intelligence Bureau is, what it does, and how large it is? I don't know the size of it, and uh, I'm sure it's grown since uh, I left the whole business more than 20 years ago. But uh, the mandate, of course, was very clear. It was collection of internal intelligence. and. Uh, uh, the priorities kept, you know, sh shifting. Like uh, I tell you, when I joined in March '69, I was uh, given a, what was called uh, in those days a B group in the communist group, which was supposed to be the most important uh, a desk there. And uh, then uh, I think uh, around 1970 or so. Mrs. Gandhi said that you guys need to clear the cobwebs of your, of your mind, you know. The threat we have is not from communism, it's from right, the right wing. And that is, if you recall, that was the time she also banned the RSS. So then the whole, whole thing shifted. Now, I don't know where it is. So you were hunting or, or, or looking at or spying on the leftists and communists in the early period? I don't think spying is exactly the, the right thing. But Collecting uh, intelligence on Yeah, yeah. For instance, I was looking after, um, my charge was West Bengal, which had a, uh, a leftist government. Ajoy Mukherjee was the chief minister, and Jyoti Babu was his deputy. So it was that kind of, but that Naxal problem was growing at that. Mm. I have many, many questions. You said something about an economy desk being important or the most important. What is that desk and what did it do? Was no, that I, what you said? I, I said the communist desk. The communist desk, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, tell me, uh, when you joined in your 20s, what was it that an officer did when he or she went into work on a Monday morning? What was the nature of the work? What, was, what did intelligence gathering mean then? Oh, yeah. Well, you had to spend uh, a minimum of three years. I actually did four years in two different, on two different desks, working at the desk, which meant seeing reports, analyzing reports, and writing reports. And report writing in the Intelligence Bureau was very different from uh, you know, the way journalists write or, or authors write. It was brief direct and very clear. So it was a different kind of uh, writing and you had to get used to it and you learned there. But you're also dependent on the input coming in from whoever's fighting From the field, reports. yeah. yeah from and the what field. does field mean in this instance? Field in, the, in, in, in my um, case would be West Bengal. 
who who would be the person filing filing the report that you would be parsing and you see we have in the bureau what we call subsidiary intelligence uh, bureaus so each state has a has a subsidiary and bengal had a large one in those days because bengal was important not only because it was a leftist government because of the naxal problem and um, also things were hotting up in in bangladesh and uh, did did any of the work involve intelligence on people other than those that the state felt threatened by was it political opponents dissenters naughty people in civil society media <laughs> you know uh Yes, some of it was uh, we were doing things which we should not have been doing, which is uh, actually not really our business. But uh, then it depends on the on the powers that be at a particular point of time. And as an officer, one would go sort of along with whatever one was told to uh, put out intelligence on. Yeah, obviously, you didn't have much of an option at that point of time. You know, we were kids, and uh, we were just uh, learning the ropes. You know? And uh, as I mentioned in the book, that uh, I uh, I was fortunate. I shared a, a room with the great M K Narayanan. He was at that point of time the senior most uh, assistant director in the bureau, just waiting to be elevated. And I was the junior most, and we were sharing a room because he was the communist chief. and uh, since i was handling a communist desk i shared a room with him uh, i learned a lot watching him i want to ask you why it is that you think he's great and what what these qualities are but just before that i want to ask you uh, if it would be accurate to say that in your tenure the ib shifted first from looking at the communist threat then looking at the rss sort of hindutva threat under mrs gandhi and then the islamist threat as as it uh matured after kashmir yeah as it as it uh, evolves now i give you an example it it might sound strange but i think um, one of the most important tasks in the intelligence bureau is counter intelligence now counter intelligence means uh, what uh, the others are doing the other countries are doing in your country to keep a watch on that you know what you talk about spies those spying in your country and yes supposed to keep a watch on that i knew i had heard of the term counter intelligence but i didn't even know the offices from which those uh, counter intelligence uh, people function because as youngsters it was none of our business to know but they were a part of the ib nonetheless of course of course and i spent about uh, about 8 or 10 years doing counter intelligence subsequently and i found it was the most interesting part of uh, of the work we'll come, in the ib we'll come to that again later uh, once again a lot of questions w what are the what what are the qualities that make for a good intelligence officer and why do you call mk narayanan great she mk was gra uh, great in in uh, in many ways yeah. one was he he knew communism on on his fingertips you know We, he had studied the texts yeah he uh, we used to have what is called uh, the friday namaz it was a friday meeting at, uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning and mk was the first one who would speak at those meetings you know i'm talking of when i joined when the focus was communism and when he spoke everybody kept quiet and and listened in, in great awe of the man also uh, we could tell as youngsters that uh, this guy is big and he's going to go places i mean we, we knew that if there is going to be a chief from amongst people we had the opportunity to mix and mingle with he he was it he's you are in your mid 20s he's in his mid 30s at this point uh yeah. yeah and at this point you can tell that this man in his mid 30s is going to absolutely, go absolutely absolutely because he was very different from the others of his time and he what what yeah yeah yeah, yeah. what are the qualities ambition hmm. knowledge hard work and um, he had it all the fact that he rose to where he did including becoming 
the national security advisor and so on you you knew at some point that the, uh, well, no, no, you didn't I, don't, know, I don't think did, he this ever, didn't surprise you no 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 I, I i don't think he ever dreamt of becoming national security advisor that was like you know like sanjay baru says the accidental prime minister so this was the accidental uh, nsa because there were two accidents one that he was called back 13 years after retirement and uh, posted as uh, uh, advisor for internal security because money dixit was the you know, nsa and then money dixit uh, passed away and so mk took over so there were two accidents there and um, i'm sure he made a good nsa may i ask uh, since you are able to analyze somebody uh, at a distance what you think your own weaknesses and strengths were as an intelligence officer oh in those days uh, you know i just thought i had a job to do you know this is a, and uh, to begin with it was quite irritating i had come from a subdivision where uh, you know i could do what i felt like doing almost and um, in the evening take a gun and go out uh, shoot partridges you know and here i was stuck in the office from from 10 to 6 or more likely 10 to 8 and i said what the hell where have i got stuck what is this rubbish you know and then gradually you realize that uh, well this may be rubbish but this is going to be your career now you can hardly get thrown out of here and go back to the state so you learn you know it comes uh, it takes time what actually uh, a watershed moment uh, you know they, they say life turns full circle but it can also go the other way and anti clockwise and then turn that way and uh, there are certain things which happen and if i had not gone to kashmir i think uh, a lot of my career after that would never have happened so kashmir played a very very big role in, in whatever happened in my later years so uh, i'm i'm going off my uh, a script but you go to kashmir in the late 80s when uh, uh, weeks before militancy breaks out in the open you suffer losses in your team four yeah. four people die i think in the first few months of the violence your team comes to you and says get us out of here because the ib doesn't want to be in kashmir perhaps if you could just tell us a little bit about those days and your role in them what it was like in kashmir in the late 80s and the early 90s yeah let me take you first back to bhopal you know i because you started by asking me where i belonged and i as i said i am a punjabi so in the punjab where i grew up muslims were a rarity you know there were no muslims except for a little pocket uh, in maler kotla and one hardly ever went to maler kotla so we never had muslims either in school college university there were no muslims so i think uh, bhopal was a great education because uh, bhopal city has about 30% muslim population and there uh, one got to know muslim families one made muslim friends and also one began to understand uh, that the muslims have a problem you know it's a uh, how and would you define that a problem from their point of view from their point of view like there was a communal riot once in 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 the city it fortunately didn't last very long and uh, i think one or two people were killed but you felt that uh, the muslimon immediately went into hiding and uh, you know after the initial whatever happened and uh, also there is a very conservative side to to muslim society i mean we had very good friends and um, to give you an example their daughter was very friendly with our daughter and she could come to our place any any time but she was told she could only come to our place and not go to anybody else's place so that kind of thing but it got it gave me a sense of of um, of muslimness you could say and that was a great stepping stone to what i had to deal with in kashmir because kashmir when i went there 
Now, of course, uh, I think it's 99 percent. In those days, it was 95, 96 percent Muslim. I'm talking of the valley. And uh, so you had to deal with Muslims. And uh, I found there was no problem. Great, fine. Did the rest of your team, who uh, presumably were mostly, if not entirely Hindu, share this uh, empathy that you carried from Bhopal to Kashmir? No, that's a, that's a good question, you know. I think um, this business of empathy is, um, is really selective and it depended on the situation on the ground. When I first went to Srinagar, and I was asked from Bhopal, I'd done four years in Bhopal, I was due a posting back to Delhi. And uh, when I was told, uh, will you go to Srinagar? I was asked, will you go to Srinagar? And I said, yeah, why not? I always felt it's better being out of headquarters, you know. Sorry, there was no sense in the India of 1988 and 1999 that this was brewing and this was about to explode. Would that no, be accurate? No, 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 no. If, if it was brewing or if it was going to explode, I wouldn't have opted for Syria. What was the IB doing in Kashmir? IB was doing what it was supposed to do everywhere. And um, Kashmir was a prize posting. It was a very important posting. And, uh, well, in those days, the mostly um, dealing with the national conference, which they thought was also shifty from Sheikh Stab's time. So it was a political uh, sort of, um, the, the, the work that the IB did was essentially political rather than yeah, you could put it in a way. Underground it, 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 was, it, was, it was political. But uh, as I said, when I first got to Srinagar, which was 31st of May, 88, I thought this is great. It's a great, great place to be. You know, summer and um, on the Sundays, we would drive out into the valley. You could go anywhere. It's as beautiful, maybe more beautiful than Switzerland and picnic and this, that. And suddenly, on the 31st of July, two months later, the bombs went off. And I said, what's going on here? And then we began to realize, of which we had no idea, either in Delhi or in Srinagar, that what was going to come, what was happening. May I ask what body of the state would have had to anticipate what happened in 1989? Would it be the IB? Who, who, who can we look at and say, you people didn't do your job or should have done something better? Now, the IB certainly, it was our job, but it was also the job of the state government, the state special branch, the state police, and um, nobody had any inkling. The, the other question that comes to my mind is, w was there a larger element of spontaneity to the violence or was it entirely, or, or, or for the most part, was it planned? So no, no, it was planned, it was planned. Oh. It was certainly planned. And it was planned over a period of uh, at least four years. You know, I, I take you back to Sheikh Saab's passing. He, he died in September 82. And I think the Pakis had uh, looked at it like this, that as long as Sheikh is around, it's best not to meddle with Kashmir. But once Sheikh Saab passed away, and then Farooq became uh, chief minister, and worse was to follow, because we dismissed uh, Farooq. So then, which was 84, then the Paki said, now is the time. And what was happening also was that Amanullah Khan, who was living in London, came back to Pakistan. And uh, he was the founder of the JKLF. So that's how the whole thing started between, uh, what was his name, the president then? Um, yeah. Ah. Zia, the I, uh, ISI, and, uh, and Aman. And tell me something about, uh, sorry, uh, tell us something about the, the atmosphere within the IB that you had, you're heading the Kashmir division, and you've got these officers with you who are uh, presumably against, mostly from outside of Kashmir, would that be accurate? Yeah, mostly from outside, but uh, there were about 30% Kashmiri pundits. Right. We had no Muslim officers in Kashmir. Right. That was to come later. Hmm. But there were about 30% uh, local boys, Kashmiri Pandits, and uh, they were possibly the best informed. And I think this is one of the more moving parts of your book. Um, uh, please tell us about, 
what something about the time that you're spending in your office going there where colleagues are getting killed where other colleagues are coming to you and saying in a group please get us out of here how does the chief deal with that you see this uh, what you have mentioned and um, actually refers to the winter of 8990 mm -hmm. so a lot was to happen before that and uh, a watershed moment really was the abduction of uh, Mufti's, yeah. Mufti's daughter, Rubaiya. And that changed everything sort of quite dramatically, you know. And because these boys who were already in business thought now, uh, if we can get uh, five of our people released just because we picked up this girl. And actually they were not intending to pick her up, they wanted to pick up Farooq's daughter. But then somebody realized that uh, this woman is, is more vulnerable, we can pick her up because she comes out of the women's hospital at three in the afternoon and, and takes a tempo home and just lift her from there in a car and take her to Sopor. Uh, that's what happened. So after that, everything began to change, you, you know. Till, till December 89, you know, I used to have one of those, when I say I, means the office used to have a Maruti 800 in which my wife and I would drive around the city without a fear of anything. But after this kidnapping, it was one suddenly felt that everything had changed, that it was dangerous going out. I used to, you know, we had a house, I mean, the official residence was on Gupkar, and I had to come down 52 steps to the road where my car was parked. And I used to, walk, as I was walking down the stairs, I used to feel, if there's a guy there in the bushes, I'm a dead duck, I'm gone. And every time, when I, I'm now referring to the time that you mentioned earlier, the, that winter, every time that I went out, of course, it was also very lonely because there was nobody in Srinagar. My family wasn't there. Most people, central government officers had left. And uh, every time that I went out of home, I, I didn't know if I was going to come back or not. One, one thing that changed certainly was the way that somebody in your position might have felt. Uh, can you describe the external change? What, what changed in the environment and in the people that you engaged with, the local population? Once all this happened, all, all engagement came to a standstill. You know, even the people we knew went, suddenly went underground. The IB did not have too much contact with people in it the population. It was very, very difficult after that, you know. As it is before, even before it started, we didn't have the best contact. Like you said, was it a failure? It was a failure. But after this happened, uh, I mean, you couldn't find anybody. There was a guy who was, uh, uh, I used to call him the whisperer, who was fond of his rum. And he would, he would bring us tales from downtown, and uh, which was the best that we could get. But you had no means of verifying whether this was accurate or inaccurate or... Well, it, was, was, in, it was interesting, so... Uh, it, it, you, it, you gave an interview to Outlook a few years ago where you said that to the best of your recollection, there was no Muslim in RAW at the time that you were in RAW. Uh, I know for a fact that today, because I, I know people there, today the IB has one senior officer who is a Muslim, who, uh, and I don't think there's anybody else in signals. No, no, in the IB, there are quite a few Muslim officers now. We've had a Muslim uh, DIB also, chief of the IB. Asif uh, Ibrahim was DIB. At, at this point in time? Not at uh, this today, point yeah. in time, but he was okay. some time ago. Maybe I should wait for the, but uh, since we are on the subject, since when has India become reluctant to engage its own minority population in the uh, intelligence services? Has it always been the case? I Was think it's always been the case, till the IB started opening up. But I don't think the RNAW has still opened up. I mean, this is an argument I used to have with, with a lot of colleagues. And did, did many people in the IB, when you were there, have uh, uh, Urdu or Pashto or Farsi? In the RNAW? Uh, in the IB. In the IB, it was not so important, but it was more important in the, in the RNAW. Languages become more important. And uh, because we did not have Muslim officers, so it, it uh, I mean, this was a handicap. 
they were they were um, uh, people trained people who went through language training but uh, the numbers were uh, were not enough we'll try and come back to kashmir later um, can you tell us what the nature of the ib's work is in places which are not disturbed like the northeast or the bengal of the 70s or kashmir today even what does the ib do in uh, karnataka why is it here it's What everywhere why well to, to keep a watch on what's happening one of the things as i told you is is, uh, is counter intelligence so if if there is a consulate here uh, a russian consulate or american consulate or a chinese or a pakistani whatever it is then uh, ib has every reason to be here but the eyes and the ears are trained towards the consulates and not at the or general population no it's trained in more ways than that but i'm just giving you an example you you write in your book that in your period and uh, i will i'll i'll uh, recommend this book i really enjoyed reading it and i learned much from it uh, you say that you 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 allude to the fact that counter intelligence has seemingly fallen out of favor in india that you don't want to engage with the opposite particularly when it comes to pakistan can you speak to that and why it is that we are doing this or uh, no see engaging with pakistan is quite different from watching pakistan you know in counter intelligence we are watching pakistan or we are watching the americans or we are watching the russians or the chinese or the british whoever it is engaging is different and i think uh, both are equally important when james bond goes out and i don't know how sort of accurate the bond movies are he tends to go directly after 7 minutes into the space where the other is your book suggests that we are not only reluctant to talk to people who might be dodgy here but we are uh, opposed ideologically to the idea that we should be is that an accurate description of what you feel yeah it is you know we refer to them as double agents and uh, double agents means as uh, somebody is working for let's say the pakis and uh he offers his services to you also now most of us are very reluctant to to But isn't it the job of the spy to be able to engage with the person who's dodgy and try and get something out of them exactly exactly so my argument always has been and um, the great mr gary saxena used to uh, agree with me he said actually double agents make the best agents because what you can otherwise not get about pakistan this fellow might bring you in the bargain he might take some stories that side then it all depended on his brain versus yours you know how smart were you and how smart was he how much are you giving and how much are you getting so it was that kind of game but you were still getting it, it and i mean i i came across a guy unfortunately after i left service and he, he was fascinating and then somebody a kashmiri told me he says this fellow can get you minutes of the of the isi meetings you know and i said what a waste why did we not use him but nobody they said no no you to pakistani hai it seems like a very elementary argument the one that you and i both are on the same side of why yeah. is it that it's so difficult to explain to somebody else particularly somebody in the spy business because of the fact that he has that brand on him pakistan i'm not talking about him i'm talking about the person doing the thinking and saying i don't want to talk to him so the thinking is like that it's the same thinking which goes into our thing what is our hesitation or inhibition to to engage with pakistan which is quite different from spying on pakistan we don't engage for the same reason that we don't trust the pakis now here actually you don't need to trust the pakis you know the best thing that the iv can do in in delhi is to have the the local uh, pakistani defense attache work for you if you can't get that then somebody in his office work for for you and if you can't get that then somebody who goes to pakistan and works for them and still brings back interesting stuff for you so there are layers of this you know this reluctance to engage with somebody who might be a double agent or might be a pakistani spy and so on is that relatively recent post kashmir's problems or did you always feel even in the 80s that this was something that no, this was always there it's always been there it's it's in our mindset you know there's something there 
that uh, Pakistan, seems, anybody who has anything to do with Pakistan cannot be trusted. It seems bizarre that you would be in the spy business and not want to engage Because you other don't side. need to, to be, uh, I mean, you don't need to trust somebody so much. In our I business, you, yeah. yeah, so that's, that's the but whole thing. you just thing. need to engage with them. Exactly, exactly. In this case, not just engage, but make use of the guy, you know. Yeah, true, yeah. true, true. But, but uh, I'm trying to narrow it down further to, is it, uh, uh, let's not use words like a stupidity, but is it bigotry that I don't want to get into no, this? No, it's not, it's not, um, it's not bigotry, not, not really. It is just, um, I would say, lack of confidence, you know. In yourself? In yourself, yeah. I'll leave it there. Uh, generally speaking, what does a country miss out when it chooses not to do deep counterintelligence within its borders? I think then you don't know what's going on in your own country. You know? Now, for instance, I give you an example. I don't know. I'm out of this business for 20-some oh. years. Now, I, I don't know how much influence the Americans have these days. Yeah. In, in within, our country. Within, within the establishment and within the... Yeah, within the country, let's say. Or how much uh, influence the Israelis have, or the Chinese have, or the Russians have. And I'm trying to understand, uh, the, you're, you're saying, I think, that we don't know this because we don't have sufficient counterintelligence. Because we are not focusing enough on counterintelligence. Right. You know, uh, the, the focus has shifted to counterterrorism, which is fair enough. Counterterrorism should be prime this thing, but not at the expense of uh, counterintelligence. Because and this is something that Rajiv, it, it fascinated Rajiv Gandhi. Incidentally, he, he was the most supportive of the agencies, uh, of all the prime ministers that I've seen. And uh, he- What he do was, you mean by that and how did it manifest itself? It manifested itself in the thing that, uh, you know, I want to know this, 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 can you, can you, get me, can you find out this, this, this for me? And if you can, then you say, what is it that you guys want? Did he give you more power or more money or like a bigger budget or he did? More, more resources. More I give resource, you an example. Resources, I was yes. then in, I was then in, in Bhopal and I had one car and uh, my... Uh, you had one car meaning the IB had one car? One car. And my junior colleague had a car, and that is all. We had two cars in the whole establishment in Madhya Pradesh. Suddenly, I got a call from Delhi saying that, do you guys want anything? I said, want what? Do you need any cars? I said, cars for what? We have two cars. He said, no, if you want some more. I said, yeah. Then I want a car for every deputy superintendent of police of mine. I want 10 cars. And we got 10 cars. And that was because it was Rajiv Gandhi's time, you know. The, there is a chapter in the book on his time in Bhopal, uh, which is during the gas uh, leak and the tragedy there, which, which, which is also recommended uh, reading. Can you tell us um, something about your shift to Raw, which happened towards the end of your career? And if I'm not mistaken, you, you're the first person from the IB to head Raw. Uh, I was, so I was the first. the first. After that, it's happened again. So it, Raw it, it had an internal cadre that it would promote and would rise up the ranks. Yeah, yeah, so naturally, but, naturally. But, uh, but you're, you're this IPS guy who came in to... Yeah, there are IPS guys in the uh, RNAW also. I mean, all the chiefs, but, all the chiefs before me in the in the RNAW were all IPS guys. But you're the first person but from the IB. Too. I was the first from the IB. It, it was just, uh, I was very lucky. Actually, what happened, uh, you know, our batch was lucky, but I was particularly lucky because I got to be chief. We were to retire, or we used to retire in those days, if you remember, at the age of 58, government services. Suddenly, government decided to raise the retirement age to 60. So I got two extra years. Mm -hmm. And uh, my colleague, uh, Shaul Datta, became the DIB. He was a slot above me in the batch. And the Home Secretary called me up and said, you know, your batchmate is going to become chief. Would you like to move out? Would you like, I can give you a, a position in one of the paramilitary organizations. You can head CRPF or BSF or whatever. I said, why should I? I spent 30 years here. Mm -hmm. I'm quite happy. He says, you'll, have, you'll be number two. I said, so be it. I mean, then I'll retire as number two. And then it so happened that there was a sort of a vacuum. 
artificial or created or what, but there was a vacuum in the RNAW and they needed somebody. And some kind soul thought of me and that's how I landed there. But you had to wait for six months before, before you joined because somebody had to No, I joined, to but it, uh, that, uh, I was told uh, you will be under study for three months. Okay. But that got extended to six months because I, the guy who named, was there... You haven't named him, but I sort of figured out... The who guy was. who was there didn't want to leave. Till he got a, uh, a, Til governorship, he got a governorship. Which he did, yeah. yeah. C can, you, can you describe to us what the difference is in either in structure or quality or resource between RAW and INB and separately... Can you describe to us what the what outcomes are expected of RAW and what it does? Well, I can give you one example, and uh, then I can tell you what uh, my boss said, which is quite uh, flattering. The example is that uh, my cabinet secretary, after I left the RNAW, because when I left the RNAW, I was roped into the prime minister's office. So my um, cabinet secretary, who was cabinet secretary earlier, Prabhat Kumar, said to me, you are the only guy who has been in both organizations. Tell me which is the better organization. I said they're both very good in their own ways. You know, The IB is much more solid, much more cohesive. It's more than 100 years old. The RNAW is comparatively much younger and not as cohesive. But man-to-man, person-to-person, I would say the RNAW is as good as the IB. What is it supposed to do? Now, it's like this, you know. Uh, i give you another example. That uh, both the IB and the, uh, the RNAW, I'm sorry to say this here, but uh, produced some uh, good-for-nothing chiefs. But in the IB, it never went out of North Block. You know? In the, in the RNAW, it would be talked about all over town. So that was one of the differences. Did it make a big difference who the chief was? Uh, or, you know, in normally, in, no, in good management organizations, since we are in Bangalore, it doesn't matter how bad the CEO is. Normally, things that are put together well tend to no, function. No, you're right, but uh, I think a chief is a chief, and he does matter in, in intelligence uh, agencies. How would you explain to a 10-year-old what RAW does? Beg your pardon? If you were to meet a 10-year-old and explain to her what RAW does, what is it that you would say? Oh, well, like I said, uh, the IB does internal inter intelligence and the RAW does external intelligence. So it's entirely focused on two things. One is foreign spies in our country. No, no, no. That's no. the IB's job. It's only focused on spying on external nations. And also the borders. And also, and also the, borders. the borders. Also the borders. So things like Cargill fall in the RAW domain? The idea that there is... More, more in the IB domain. But the Jammu and Kashmir border, for instance, uh, would fall in, in, in the RNAW domain. And sorry to be uh, a banal, but what, what size was RAW when you were there in terms of number of people? I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't would it know. Be 5, I, I've been very bad with numbers. I, I've okay. never... I, I failed in arithmetic also, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you got into the IB, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, um, what what a proportion of the of raw when you were there was looking uh, east at China and what proportion was looking west at Pakistan? I think uh, almost an equal number. Uh, obviously, looking west meant also Afghanistan. Yes. So they were more looking west than looking east, but um, the whole neighborhood was our top priority, you know. And you felt in your year there uh, that it was a competent enough organization to be to be able to manage the challenges that it had. Yeah, yeah, of course. First class. You, uh, did I hear you, you say You know, I, I, I wrote that book with uh, General Durrani. Mm. And he concedes. I mean, I, I didn't ask him. He himself says that the RNAW is, is, a, is a more competent organization than the ISI. But if I were your uh, enemy, I would flatter you. No, he was not flattering me. He wasn't. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I went to Karachi, you know, and I, a TV uh, guy interviewed me. And his last question was, what do you think of the ISI? And I said, the ISI is great. I'd love to be ISI chief, you know. But 
That's we'll just come back to. I say I have a very very small question. Uh, what what uh, did, did you have very large numbers of people within RAW who had uh, Urdu and Pashto and Mandarin? Yeah, yeah, there were people. I don't know about Pashto, but Urdu, yes, and, and uh, large numbers. So there, there was never any problem in terms of interpretation or no, finding no, out. No, no, not Urdu and uh, not uh, not Mandarin. Also, there were Chinese knowing people. Do you echo General Durrani's? A view that the raw is better than the ISI. I don't know. I, I think we are. We are professionally. But the difference here is, you know, why I said I'd like to be um, ISI chief. Those guys have so much autonomy. You know, they can do what they like. Here, we are being watched all the time. You know, um, um, our friend Manish Tiwari talks about uh, parliamentary oversight over the agencies. I don't know whether it's time for that, but there has always been oversight. There always is oversight. Now, I used to report to, to Brijesh Mishra, who was both principal secretary and NSA in those days. And incidentally, he, he used to rate the RNAW higher than the IB for whatever reasons. And both uh, Shamal Datta and I were pretty close to he him. He comes across as a fairly nice person in your book, like so somebody who gets along. By, by that I mean. I don't know about a nice person, but we sorry, had a, maybe not we, nice we had a terrific the equation. Yeah. But I think he was much smarter than I thought he was. Yeah. Uh, I'll have uh, maybe two or three questions and then we'll go to the audience. Um, if I would. This is a part of your interrogation. It is. So the. If I were to summarize what the outcomes the ISI uh, seeks to achieve, they would be to, with a much smaller military budget, to neutralize its larger neighbor. It would be to produce enough mischief on its western front to be able to either neutralize or bring on board its eastern neighbor. Um, and I think that to a large extent, it seems to have achieved a lot of what it's done and acts as a sort of uh, not balanced so much as a, 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 a force that adds to military weight and has done with very limited resource what it could have. I'm trying, I'm sort of uh, struggling to think of what, what great things RAW has done to match that. Uh, have we well, done we, things? We've done, uh, we've done everything. I, I don't think uh, there's been any, anything that the RNRW could not do or we have not done. But, um, coming to what you just said, that, yeah, you know, the ISI got involved in, in, in terrorism. And uh, mm -hmm. so that came at great cost uh, to us. And to them. And to them, but more, more at initially much, much more to us, because uh, both Punjab and, and Kashmir were simultaneously affected. But uh, the... The, the Pakistani still doesn't understand Kashmir or the Kashmiri, you know? And this is an argument I've had with them. I said, you guys will never understand the Kashmiri because Kashmir is India. It's part, part of us. We deal with them on a daily basis. They come and tell you stories, and then they go back and tell somebody else another story, you know? So you're saying that they failed at a much more deeper level though they may have succeeded, or, or they might think that they've succeeded at, at at least one level. Yeah, they did succeed at one level. They caused um, a lot of mayhem. And do we do this sort of mischief elsewhere in the world? I'm not aware of it. You're not aware of it. <laughs> my, last question, my, my last question is about the current national security advisor who was your junior in the IB, uh, uh, Mr. Doval. Tell us about the kind of person he is. And a separate question is that he was tasked with putting together a national security framework five years ago, which he hasn't still written. Why do you think that is? If you know, know or can, can give us a glimpse into the mind of somebody who takes five years to write something and not you know, come up with it. But what, what kind of man was he when you were working with him? You see, uh, Ajit and I have been, I mean, we've been contemporaries. I was a few years senior to him, but uh, we work together, we've been friends. When I say we've been friends, I think we're still friends. And uh, he helped me in a couple of difficult situations. I think I helped him in a couple of difficult situations. But uh, our way of thinking, now, now let's take Kashmir. 
you, you know, there was a time when he was posted to Kashmir. And uh, I was at uh, headquarters in Delhi looking after Kashmir, overseeing Kashmir. And I knew that Ajit would uh, handle Kashmir differently. I said, it doesn't make a difference to me. I want Doctrinally, results. can you just explain the difference? I want results. And if, if you're going to do it your way and you can produce results, go ahead and do it your way. I have no issue, no problem with that. But I would still do it my way. Now, I mean, uh, his way is, is prevailing, yeah. the muscular way. Now, whether in the long run it's the right way or the wrong way, time will tell. As far as the, the this, uh, thing you say, the, the doctrine, the doctrine uh, we've heard about Doval doctrine. But I, I don't know what it means, really. No. Offensive, I, defensive, defensive, does, offensive. Does he like the Pakistan? He's not get Kashmir? No, I, I, yeah, you see, it requires a lot of patience to understand Kashmir. Which he doesn't have? No, he has, but he's, he's never devoted himself to that. He's, he's had too many things on his plate. So, and also you need empathy to understand Kashmir. Otherwise, you won't understand Good Kashmir. Good word. Does he have the intellectual wherewithal to put together a national uh, a security doctrine that has to accommodate China, modern warfare, tech, and so on? He has it, but I don't think he knows which way, uh, I mean, what the requirements are. Because the requirements keep uh, changing and swinging. You mean from the top? From the top. But shouldn't a national security advisor be sending it from the bottom rather than receiving from the top? You should be sending it from the bottom, but you're always looking to the top. We will take questions from the audience. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Sir, you were uh, with the intelligence at a time uh, during the 80s, wherein India was fighting insurgencies in the Northeast, Punjab, Kashmir, and Sri Lanka. So my question is that uh, why is the approach towards Punjab and Kashmir insurgency is totally different? In Punjab, we had the Punjab police uh, spearheading the, uh, like the counter-terrorism initiatives under KPS Gill. Whereas in Kashmir, we adopted an army-heavy approach, paid a heavy price, and only then later in the late 90s, we started putting Jammu and Kashmir police again in the forefront. And sir, please pardon me. I mean, I was a kid back then. Whatever I've read, it's from books. Thank you very much. No, no. You see, uh, the, the answer is quite simple, quite straightforward. Uh, because the Punjabi is quite different from the Kashmiri, you know. So, uh, I mean, it goes without saying that the Punjab police is the toughest in the country, you know. And they have no qualms in, in bashing up anybody. So KPS Gill knew what he was dealing with. But uh, the Kam uh, Kashmiri is a little di different. There was a time when uh, Rajesh Pilot seriously considered sending Gill as uh, governor to, to JNK. And uh, he discussed it with me. And uh, then I heard that Gill Saab says, there's no point in my going there as governor. If you want me there, I should be there as DG. And uh, so again, Rajesh said, what is your view? I said, um, I said, you know, it's, it's, diff it's, it's not going to be easy for Gilsab because he'll have to restrain himself here. The, the Kashmiri can't take too much uh, beating, and I don't think that's the way to deal with the Kashmiri. So in any case, um, the, the governor preempted everybody and appointed his own uh, DG in the meantime. So it never happened. Gil Saab never went to Kashmir. But the two states are quite different, you know. Like, um, I mean, uh, let me give you an example of interrogations. You know, we, in those days, uh, the best intelligence used to come incidentally from interrogation when you caught somebody. And, uh, you know, if you caught a, a Sardar, and uh, you beat him up, or before you could beat him up, he will tell you what he had to tell you. And you could beat him up as much as you wanted. That story wouldn't change. In the case of uh, the Kashmiri, it would change three times, you know. And um, every time you started to beat him, he would give you a new version of the story. So there are different types of, of people, you know. I've always told the Kashmiris, I mean, I've I've watched Kashmir now for more than 35 years that you're a lot of fun, but you're a lot of fun. Thank you, sir. Oh, ma'am.
Good evening, Mr. Dalat, Mr. Patel. I'm Kiran Tave, and I work with a private defense intelligence firm. So my question is more about the institution of intelligence in India. Like we talked about how uh, there are inhibitions to engage with minorities or double agents, and also maybe perhaps the younger generation of India who want to serve the intelligence in some way, because I reckon the IB exam, which is one exam that I know the age limit is 27 compared to UPSC, which is 32, very fewer direct access uh, to joining either IB or r and w So do you think it should be more open to people who want to serve the intelligence, or are we better off? Is it in our national interest to have a closed recruitment strategy? Thank you so much. No, you see, the thing is that in, in our country, our system is that you have to go through the UPSC. There is no other way of joining anything. <laughs> in, uh, in most of the other um, the Western countries and the advanced countries, people are picked up uh, from uh, schools and colleges and universities, you know. So it's, it's a different thing. And uh, which is the better way of going about it? I, I still think the, the British way is pretty good, except that uh, they do produce an occasional uh, Kim uh, <laughs> Philby. But uh, how do we know how many we have? How many moles do we have? That is only from the left, though. Hmm? From, the, from the combination. The left or the right. The point is, do we know how many we have? Or how many we've had? I don't think so. Sir, uh, my name is Saurabh. Um, I have no connection to uh, intelligence or anything of that sort. Good. Just very broad question. I think you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, I think you uh, mentioned that you had a tenure in Kashmir during like 1989, 90s, right? Like, and I think it's. Uh, I mean, when you were saying this, like, it occurred to me that it was also very interesting era geopolitically, right? Like, you had the Russia getting divided, Pakistan getting its nuclear bomb, Myanmar having its like you know first uh, multi-party election after like 20 years and things like that, right? So uh, my question. And I just wanted to sort of like hear your insights or experience. Like, how how did this like geopolitics like sort of like you know uh, resulted into like ground action in some sense, right? Like, what was uh, did you see anything different? Did it like affect like things? I, I'm sure it's obviously a yes answer, but like, what has been some uh, sort of your experience during that time uh, when you think about these things? Yeah. I, I think I mentioned it that you know in times of crisis, and particularly if you're serving abroad, which uh, we do in the RNAW. I, I didn't serve abroad, but uh, uh, I did serve in the Kashmir. I mean, I did serve in Kashmir in, at a difficult time. It becomes, uh, it's a very lonely world, you know, because you are just with yourself. I remember my chief visiting me after Rubaiya's kidnapping, and he came just to inquire and, and look after, you know, also we were losing our own officers. So he came to check on the morale, and he found that I was drinking quite, lo quite a lot. And he said, uh, you're drinking heavily. I said, hey, there's nothing else to do here. Once the sun sets, you know, what do you do? You're all by yourself. Hi. So my name is Shashank. I'm one more prosaic civilian. No connection with the intelligence industry. I'm in the financial services space. I have two questions. Uh, how well does the intelligence community assimilate new practices, such as use of technology, use of maybe non-state actors, use of dirty tactics, which you know everyone around us seem to be doing, and we seem to have a higher moral ground about it. The second question is also kind of related to that, is that not being muscular in the past does not seem to have yielded results, unless you know I have missed something. Being muscular seems to be getting results. So your take on that, please. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, being muscular will always show results. Um, being the opposite, uh, you, you don't know what's going on. So, but it doesn't mean that there are no results, you know. And uh, as far as uh, technical use of te technology goes, of course, the, the whole world is progressing. And tech it is, is becoming increasingly important. But I'm one of those old timers who believes that no matter how much advance there is in technology, without the guy on the ground, uh, without you, what we call human, uh, tech it by itself is no good. What about giant balloons in the sky? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
You could take a ride on one of those. <laughs> Uh, my, quest my name is C.K. Sharma. Uh, my question is uh, somewhat different from the questions everybody else has asked you. Uh, you have quoted John Le Carre in, in the book, and you've given special reference to uh, his, virtually his last book, Agent Running in the Field. In your opinion, which is the writer of uh, the shadows uh, who comes closest to the truth? Without any doubt, uh, Le Carre. I mean, you will find, uh, I don't think you'll find a James Bond in our business, but uh, uh, you might find smileys around. Can you repeat that line from him on the, on the nation and its fight? I've forgotten the line because I, uh, you might have it. I, I quoted it from there, but yeah, he says the, the best way to, to judge a, a, a a nation's psyche is by looking at what uh, the intelligence services are doing. Correct. Uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Sir. Broadly. Uh, good evening, Mr. Dalit. My name is uh, Harsh Vardhan. I have two questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, first would be that what is it that you look at in your experience and in all these years, as per in your opinion, what has been one of our biggest uh, failures or intelligence failures, if, we, if you'd like to point out something. And second, uh, as somebody who has been in the system, what would be your comment on something like a Mithrokin archives? Beg your pardon? What would be your... Uh, you want me to repeat the question? No, no the, the second... Do, what do you know the what the Mithrokin... Mithrokin archives. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I... I'm not so familiar with the Mithrokin uh, archives. I, I've seen the book and I've sort of flipped through it, but uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I suppose the uh, question is: Would we, would we as a nation, be op willing or open to releasing? Yeah, 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 spy yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've said that over and over again that uh, it's high time that the intelligence bureau, which is more than a hundred years old, had uh, its official history written. Because if uh, MI5, MI6, the CIA, the KGB, everybody has it done, then uh, why not us? I mean, maybe the RNAW can wait a while, but um, yeah. No reason for the IB to write it. Uh, yes, please. Um, you grew up at a time when intelligence and data gathering was supposed to be the domain of somebody who was responsible. Today, everybody has a cell phone and is spying on the neighbor. Shouldn't somewhere there be a line between you know, individual privacy and uh, you're, you're authorized to have information. It is your domain, it is your duty. But today, this um, cell phone technology, which is enabling every individual to know what the neighbor is doing, every chowkidar in the building knows what a man and wife are doing in bed. That is what has happened to data today. And this uh, thrust towards big data collection, which is monitoring individuals, even mannerisms, um, don't you think we've gone a bit far? Madam, I can tell you that I was not involved in Pegasus. <laughs> but, but, but yes, you were the, fortunate to the have The rest of it, I think, is legitimate, you know. It's all right. But uh, if somebody wants to overhear me or to collect uh, data on me or spook on me, I, uh, we've all been doing it. So I guess it's OK. It's <laughs> payback time. Do we have any more questions? I have one last one for you from my side. Would and then I would like two minutes also. Indeed. Because a thought comes to my mind. Why don't you go ahead first? No, no OK. Actually, it's like, uh, you know, I, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. You know, I, I was quite sure today I'd be asked about Musharraf because he just died yesterday. And it, I was very sorry that he'd, the old man had died. And uh, I don't know about his, um, what he did in Pakistan and about, uh, his military career and uh, his, the coup and, and whatever happened with him and his uh, core commanders and the ISI and blah, blah. I would only like to say that in reference to Kashmir, we've not had a Pakistani leader as reasonable as Musharraf was. 
Time and time again, he said, whatever is acceptable to Kashmir and Kashmiris would be acceptable to Pakistan. And no other Pakistani leader has said anything like that. So now we come to his four-point formula. It's called the four-point formula. There are, I think, five or six narratives of the four-point formula. That doesn't matter. For the Kashmiri, and incidentally for the Kashmiris, 9-11 was a watershed moment because the Kashmiri felt that this fellow that we look up to has actually surrendered to the Americans. You know, when Bush read the riot act to him and said, either you're with us or you're against us after 9-11. And he had to join the war, so-called war against uh, terror. But despite that, when he talked about, uh, you know, trying to resolve Kashmir or moving forward on Kashmir and his four-point formula, nobody talk, took those four points so seriously. But in the Kashmiri mind, what it gave him was hope that here is a Pakistani who is willing to talk peace and with whom the Indian leadership is willing to engage. You say that from your point of view, he was the most reasonable Pakistan leader. What the Kashmir context. Indeed. Yes. What would the Pakistani view be? Who would be the most reasonable Indian leader that they've dealt with? Oh, without doubt, Vajpayee. Thank you very much, Mr. Dullat, for your time, for coming here and speaking to us. Thank you to BIC. Thank you most of all to you for having uh, come here on a Monday. A round of applause for our guest, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Akar Sahib. It's, it's been a privilege uh, being interrogated by you. And thank you all. Everybody knows you are the star of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.